Well, thanks everyone. Sorry for the uh, few minutes delay. I'm happy to welcome you to our session today at the World Water Week, um, which is called From Forecast to Prevention, Acting on Resource-Related Conflicts. My name is Susanne Schmeier. I uh, work for the Water, Peace and Security Partnership and IHE Delft, and I'm going to be your host and moderator today. Um, well, this session, as you can see on the background slide, is convened, co-convened by a number of different partners, the Government of the Netherlands, the EU Commission, the World Resources Institute, the German Development Corporation, GIZ, IHG Delft, and the Water, Peace and Security Partnership. And what we'll do today is we'll focus on a question that I think is, is very timely in, in light of, of recent developments. It's the question why in spite of the fact that very often we know a crisis is brewing up and very often we have indication, we have early warning of crisis brewing up. Why are policymakers at the local, at the national, but also at the international level often not acting on it? And we will of course focus specifically on questions relating to water, climate, energy and food security and the crisis, the instability and conflict risks that are related to those. Um, before we get started with the content, just a few housekeeping remarks. Please keep yourselves muted. Uh, we're very curious to hear everyone's comments, thoughts, questions, which you can do through the chat function. And also, just for those who haven't noticed it yet, there is a uh, translation function because this session will be held simultaneously in French and English. So should you require translation anytime, please use that function. And without any further ado, I would like to hand over um, to our first speaker, Mrs. Hilde Hardemann, who is the head of the EU Service for Foreign Policy. She has a really long experience in the EU, working on EU foreign policy, instruments and we're very happy to have you here Hilde Hardemann today the floor is yours thank you so much uh, good morning everybody I'm really honored uh, with this occasion uh, to be here with you today um, as it was already said uh, by our host climate change presents us with unprecedented challenges and this event mm -hmm. rightly puts water in a central position for understanding complex dynamics of peace and conflict. The role of water in peace and conflict is not new. It's as old as mankind. But of course, with climate change, what was and has been for centuries, a difficult issue is being further exacerbated. And this link between natural resource management and the emergence of tensions crisis and conflict around the world are widely recognized and I believe evident to us all. It's excellent therefore that today's event moves beyond exploring those linkages to addressing the question of how to foresee and most importantly prevent such conflicts before they escalate. Now within the European Union, water is central to the commitments of the European Union's new Green Deal. And there is also a firm commitment and indeed practice in the EU's foreign and security policy to systematically integrate water along with other climate and environmental risks into our conflict analysis toolbox. This key natural resource, water, there's nothing that we need as much as water, is further prioritized across our development cooperation and peace building instruments in recognition of the importance of what we call the water, peace and conflict nexus. Through our, throughout our work in peace building and crisis response, we prioritize preventive measures, for example, by building partners capacity to analyze specific climate related security threats. And in parallel, we help creating early warning systems at local level to anticipate the evolving needs of vulnerable communities, address emerging situations and develop adaptation strategies. Engaging on water and natural resources management spans a wide range of interrelated issues, 
including forced displacement, transboundary cooperation, institutional capacity building. Now, given this complexity to be effective, we need comprehensive and cross-sectoral responses, and we need to work across borders because water and water-related issues do not stop at borders. That is why the EU works closely with actors from member states, partner countries, international, international organizations, businesses, NGOs across the globe, and through initiatives such as the Frexis project in the Sahel. This project will be discussed in more detail later in our meeting, but I would like to highlight two aspects already now that seem particularly important to me. First, the importance that we give to understanding linkages so that one can act upon them. Frexis examines the links between natural resources, the negative effects of climate change and conflicts, and this in turn enables stakeholders to understand these interactions and to mitigate potential negative effects in their natural resources management. So this is not just about analysis, it is about action. And secondly, and crucially, the importance of empowering local communities. Through capacity building, communities can themselves design and implement climate and conflict sensitive measures to manage their resources and ecosystems peacefully. It's a tall order, I know, but it is only by focusing uh, on these issues uh, that we can really make a progress. I'm truly delighted to see that the discussion today will benefit from the invaluable experience of experts who have been looking into these matters for many years. Our partners in the Sahel in particular have a lot to share with us on the challenges they face and the approaches they take. We all know uh, that there is much justified cause for concern when we discuss these questions and we are keenly aware that the challenges are tremendous and time critical. At the same time, I'm also confident when I see the level of engagement and attention from across the scientific, environmental and peace building communities. Let me reiterate the EU's commitment to working with partners to achieve more sustainable, peaceful management of water and other key vital resources. We should never forget that together, if we work well, if we act cleverly on the basis of the analysis that we make, that we can make a real difference that matters on the ground for many concrete people. So thank you very much indeed, and let us make the most of this opportunity. I wish you a good session. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind welcome words. Um, very important messages indeed. Um, in order not to lose too much time, I would hand over directly to our next speaker. We have a keynote from Henk Owing. Henk Owing is the Dutch Special Envoy for Water. He also was um, the Sherpa of the High Level Panel of Water and Peace. So definitely someone um, who knows his way around in the water and in the peace and security community. So Henk, we're very curious what you have to share with us. Thanks so much, Susanna. Uh, uh, and, and, and thank you, Ms. Holleman, for giving your insights, but also your commitment uh, to this cause of water, peace and security. So critically important uh, in the context of the emerging crisis that is only increasing. Uh, water and climate are root causes for conflict and migration and working hard on water and climate means not only that we reduce risks, and we save lives and livelihoods uh, for many. Uh, and that is something we have to step up our actions. The Water, Peace and Security Partnership and Initiative um, uh, is focusing on, um, of course, policymakers. And I'd like to uh, take that part. How can policymakers take effective action to prevent conflict? Uh, so often to, uh, you know, not on the ground, but still uh, uh, with a massive responsibility. World leaders in taking decisive action need the right tools. Yeah. Many climate security issues play out through this water cycle. And in many hotspot areas, people are vulnerable to extreme weather conditions affecting water access and quality, destabilizing 
communities, in particular the most vulnerable. It's this aggregating uh, uh, aspects of risks that only compound and hit the most vulnerable, not only hardest, but longest. Uh, it shows also that the relationship between water, climate and security needs our full attention, understanding and urgent action. Uh, and attention is not enough, but we need to really understand these complex relationships and rapidly join, adapt our ways of living to this new reality, uh, mitigating the risks. That means scaling up climate adaptation. Societies will be able to withstand pressures of a quickly changing climate. But how do we then prioritize conflict prevention based on conflict prediction? If we want to mitigate climate and security risks, we need to address the intricate relationships between water, peace and security. I think I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, I know, eh? but uh, we have to make sure that we message this across and making connections to the ones that understand this eh, from the climate, water uh, world uh, to the security uh, world and beyond. This is exactly why the Netherlands launched the Water, Peace and Security Partnership. It develops tools to help identify water-related security risks and enables communities to take early actions. Eh? It starts with understanding, with data and publications, then focuses on mobilization, in a diplomatic way with defense and de development and disaster response, really focuses on learning, uh, taking best lessons and uh, next steps forward, linking these water-related challenges and focusing on a dialogue, building capacity and enabling environment, both institutionally as well as informally before moving to action. Recently, the partnership held several workshops in Iraq and Mali. For the first time, representatives of farmers, herders, fishermen, and the security sector were brought together. And this is exactly what water can do. It can take us apart as societies, but also our environment with the devastating risks that come with too much or too little or polluted water. But if we organize well based on that understanding, these interlinkages can also bring us together. And this proved to be very important to raise awareness for the relationship between water and security. Uh, uh, the initiatives by the Water, Peace and Security. Then why, despite all these early warning tools, preventive action in the event of water, food and energy conflict still lagging behind, eh? since we're so much aware and we have all these tools there. To act on the security implication, implications of climate change, water, food and energy related conflicts, we have a solid foundation to do so and can build on extensive work done by the Planetary Security Initiative and others. We need to investigate potential areas of joint actions to speed up resiliency building and risk reduction from water impacts affecting global security. And we need to further integrate climate, water, food and energy related security risk into strategic partnerships and implement early warning tools in our local communities. We need to closely monitor the security implications through regular reporting and examining these reports with others and highlight good practice mechanisms for climate adaptation examining the role of water in these issues and identifying areas of cooperation in conflict regions. We hold the key to a comprehensive response. Let's unlock the tools to jointly address the nexus between water, peace and security. And as co-chair of the UN 2023 Conference on Water, together with Tajikistan, the Netherlands will of course ensure that climate and security will get ample attention uh, in that conference, in the road towards 2023, but more importantly, in the implementation and the road after. Uh, communities need access to tools and information to allow them to take earlier action, to be enabled, uh, and we need that type of support. And the Netherlands stands ready to continue and step up uh, to that support. And we really look forward to work with our colleague member states, the European commissions, the Water, Peace and Security Initiative and Partnership, and many, many others to make sure that a water secure world is not a dream, uh, but a definitely a, a possible reality. And in, in the context of the current crises, we see Afghanistan, Stan naming one, uh, water risks are so much related to security risks and so much related to humanitarian uh, issues. We have to step up our actions and we stand ready. Uh, to continue that partnership. And I want to thank you all and uh, wish you a good session here in Stockholm, digitally Stockholm.
uh, and look forward to, to continue uh, our work together. Thanks a lot, Hank. Um, thanks for this uh, really call for all of us to, to act together and address the crisis. Um, one prerequisite to act upon crisis is to actually know that they're happening and ideally know that they will be happening before they actually happen. And this is why we need early warning tools. And one early warning tool that the Water, Peace and Security Partnership together or with the support also not only of the Dutch but also the German government has developed is our global early warning tool for water, energy and food related risks. And uh, Charlie Iceland from the World Resources Institute, the Global Director of Water at WRI will now give you a run through the tool and what it can do. Charlie, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Susanna. And um, if you can just bring my my PowerPoint up. Uh, it's a very visual tool. So uh, I want to give you visuals so that you get a, a good impression of, of what's available. Of course, you don't have to track all the details on the maps and slides I present. Uh, it's more of an impressionistic presentation. Uh, so good morning, everyone. I'm Charlie Iceland. I, I direct WRI's uh, water program. And I'm going to give you a, a quick overview of the WPS early warning tool. Uh, first, though, I, I want to thank um, our partners, uh, including the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs and GIZ. Without their help and partnership, we couldn't do what we do. Next slide, please. Okay, so the, the early warning tool in a nutshell uh, predicts conflict over the coming 12 month period. Uh, why are we doing this? Uh, well, water-related conflict is an increasingly pressing issue throughout the developing world. In 2017 alone, water was a major factor in conflict in at least 45 countries, according to the UN. And recent analysis done by the Pacific Institute finds that such conflicts are growing in number over time. Next slide, please. Uh, in defining and tracking conflict, uh, we use a database prepared by an organization called the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, uh, or we use its acronym ACLED for short. Next slide, please. So uh, uh, an overview of the global model. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we predict conflict over the coming 12 month period where conflict is defined as at least 10 deaths. Uh, we could have made the cut off point one death or 12 or 20 deaths. Uh, uh, so that's, that's um, you know, so something that we need to define or redefine as needed. Uh, we use a random forest machine learning model that identifies patterns between conflict and over 200 variables, so some going back as far as 10 years or more. Uh, we make predictions of conflict or a peace at the sub-state or sub-provincial level. So, so it's, it's a high degree of, of geographic granularity. Uh, we update the variables and the model predictions every three months um, <clears throat> and post these to the WPS website. Our methodology and all our data are published on the, w, uh, on the WPS website and are freely accessible to the public. Our model identifies correlation, not causation, uh, at least for the time being. And our data sets include numerous real-time climate and water-related variables. Next slide, please. Our initial machine learning model reveals that, that many of these indicators that you see here have significant value in predicting future conflicts. Our top predictive values uh, uh, sorry, our top predictive variables include demographic, economic, water, food, and governance variables. In addition, past conflict is a good predictor of future conflict. And so uh, a number of the variables you see here relate to past conflict. Uh, we only use the top 15 to 20 variables in terms of their predictive value. So we don't run the model each time with 200 variables. We limit it to the top 15 or 20 so as not to over-specified model. Uh, next slide, please. Global model results. Uh, we predict 86% of conflicts. We over-predict emerging conflicts. And so that's a deficiency that, the, that we're working to improve upon. 
And we're a lot better at predicting ongoing conflicts than emerging ones. And that may make intuitive sense. Uh, next slide, please. This is what the landing page of the early warning tool looks like. Uh, the map currently on the website uh, is for the period of June 2021 through May of 2022. And we're going to rerun the model and, and post the, the new map in, in a few weeks from now. Next slide, please. Our demographic indicators, uh, one of which you see here, are among the ones with the top predictive capacity. The growing populations in the developing world are putting more pressure on natural resources and bring community, communities into greater competition over fixed or even declining natural resources. Next slide, please. Growing incomes in the developing world are pulling many people out of poverty, but they're also likely putting greater pressure on fixed or diminishing natural resources. Next slide. With our global tool, we can track uh, many phenomena that either contribute to or result from conflict, such as precipitation anomalies, which is what you see here. Uh, next slide or evapotranspiration anomalies, uh, an indicator of crop health, which is what you see here. Next slide, please. Uh, we can track and, and display conflicts of, of various kinds. So here you see uh, recent conflicts uh, using the ACLED database. As you can see, there are conflicts of various types uh, in different colors. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we can also show displacements of populations uh, due to conflict or natural uh, disasters, and, and that's what you're seeing here. And so these and many other variables are available to you to um, look at uh, online. So what, what are our next priorities in terms of further developing the global tool? Well, we, we want to improve our forecast modeling, including our, our uh, random forest model, and we're developing a second predictive model. Uh, second, we want to develop a causal model so that we can better understand causation uh, uh, among the variables. Uh, we're performing data deep dives to better understand instances in which our predictions fail. We're adding high value data sets, such as near real time satellite imagery of things such as reservoir extents or crop health or deforestation, et cetera. And we're also improving communication and accessibility of our results. Next slide. One of our top goals is to increase the global awareness of these issues among development, defense, disaster response, and, and uh, diplomatic officials and practitioners. Uh, we're also trying to enhance the capacity of these actors uh, to address these problems. Next slide, please. And so how do we use the global tool and, and what are its limitations? Well, for, first we use it to identify hotspots of conflict and water challenges. Uh, second, we, we use it to compare across regions and establish priorities. Uh, third, we use the underlying data to try to better understand why the model may be predicting conflict or peace in a certain location. And then if we want to look further, we move from the global tool to local tools. Uh, so so uh, we conduct local analysis and engagement in selected countries using these local tools. Uh, so far, we're, we're working in Mali and Iraq. We're beginning work in Kenya, and we're also beginning work in Ethiopia. And so um, last slide, please. Uh, I know I've presented you with a lot of information in a short amount of time. I'd be happy to answer any questions either after this session or, or if there's a Q&A uh, uh, time. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Charlie. Thanks for sharing um, information about the forecasting tool. We'll now move into the panel discussion that will focus exactly on the question how tools such as the one that was just presented can actually be used to lead to action? How can they ensure that action is taken at all in order to mitigate or ideally even prevent conflicts? And how can they also help design the respective responses to conflicts? So making sure that 
if policymakers, be it from the global 4D community or be it from local and national governments, respond in a way that is indeed not only timely, but also affected, effective and targeted. And for that, I'm very happy to have three um, panelists with me here today. We have Sharon Borg, who in the Obama administration served as the Assistant Secretary of Defense, focusing on environmental and energy security. Um, has a long career in the US administration and certainly an expert um, for, let's say, the global level of water, food, energy, and, and security. We do have Abdu Mumuni Musa. He is the technical director at the Niger Basin Authority, a regional river basin organization in Western Africa. And he was previously the director general for water um, in the Ministry of Water and Sanitation of Niger. So definitely an expert on the Niger River Basin and Niger as a country with all the challenges that it is facing in relation to water, energy, and food. And the third one is Nouradin Zakaria Touré, the president of the National Coordination of Niger Basin Users in Mali. So the organization that represents water users. Um, in or to other actors such as, for example, the Niger Basin Authority. So bringing in the, the user perspective. Welcome to, to all the three panelists. My first question goes to Sharon. Um, Sharon, do you think generally that the world is aware of the challenges relating to water, energy and food and the implications they might have uh, on security? And why does that maybe not lead to the action that we would like to see? Oh, thank you, Susanna, and uh, th thank you for the privilege of being with all of you today. Um, I wish we were all together uh, in Stockholm in person, but this is certainly um, the next best thing. So I, to answer your question, I really don't think the world is aware, un unless you're actually living through a crisis. I don't think so. And when you're in the middle of a crisis, it's all you can see. So if you live in southern Madagascar right now, I'm sure you're acutely aware of the challenges of food and water and even how climate change fits into them. Um, but you don't have the bandwidth really to see much past that moment. Um, you know, I think even with um, foreign policy and national security experts, uh, the community that, that I come from, I don't think that, that we think of water, food and climate change at the top of our lists, you know, not the same way that they think about armed conflict or political and economic power. And so like I would say that's the case, for example, with the role that drought and hydropower shortages are playing in instability right now in Syria and Turkey and Iraq. I'm not sure it's being taken into account um, as well as it should be. But you know, another aspect of this lack of awareness is that you know, we tend to pay attention to these links just during the crisis when it's much more difficult to address them and then turn to other concerns as you know as soon as that immediate crisis is passed even if those underlying problems have not been addressed or resolved and you know in a bigger picture i think it's also human nature that it's just hard to think about complexity about the ways that water energy food climate security stability peace how these things are all intertwined and affect each other we just i think we just have limited cognitive skill for understanding that, that kind of, of nexus, that kind of complexity, let alone planning effectively for it and anticipating it and seeing that whole bigger picture. It's just a lot easier to pull you know, one of those strands out and solve just for that variable. So you know, that's one of the reasons that I'm so interested in the water peace and security tool, because it is really hard to do that kind of anticipatory planning. And especially when you're talking about complex forces and, and the, the things that we may not have to address until they're a crisis, it gives us a way to, to think, to pull apart that complexity and to, and to look ahead. So no, I, I don't think the awareness is where we need it to be if we're going to be able to address these kinds of problems in a more systemic way. Thanks, Thanks a lot, um, Sharon. So there's a lot of work left for for all of us. I'd like to take this specifically to one region that has certainly seen its share of, of water, energy and food security or insecurity challenges. And I'd like to ask Abdul Mumuni Musa, what do you think are the key challenges when it comes to water, energy and food 
in the Niger River Basin, uh, in the Niger River, sorry, uh, basin. And um, do you think we know enough about these challenges in order to also act on them? Okay, um, I see there's a, a little problem. We'll see if, if we're doing better if we move to Nouradine Zakaria Touré, um, also from the region. I'd also like to, to know from you, um, Nouradine Touré, what are the key challenges in the region and do you think we have sufficient basis to act on them? Uh, Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Oui, très bien. Ok. Il y a quand même un écho. Si vous pouvez. Oui, oui, oui. C'est la tradition. Uh, merci beaucoup, uh, Madame. Vous, vous me recevez? Oui, très okay. bien. Ok. Merci beaucoup, uh, Madame. Uh, Euh, de nous avoir invité à ce panel extrêmement important. Je voudrais euh, dire que au niveau de au niveau de du Sahel et particulièrement dans le nord du Mali que je connais très bien les défis par rapport à l'eau, la paix et la sécurité, pour dire euh, l'eau comme vecteur de paix et de sécurité dans le Sahel. On peut, euh, entre autres, parler de la participation active de tous les acteurs, y compris les femmes et les jeunes, de l'engagement des parties prenantes, de la responsabilisation de chaque acteur, de la protection des personnes et de leurs biens, du respect des engagements pris par les différents acteurs et enfin une attention particulière aux couches vulnérables comme les handicapés, les femmes et les jeunes. Voilà un peu quelques défis liés à l'eau, la paix et la sécurité. Maintenant, je termine par un exemple que nous avons connu dans la région de Gao, dans le nord du Mali. Et pendant l'occupation en 2012 par les groupes djihadistes et en l'absence de l'État et, de et des forces de sécurité, les populations se sont vite retrouvées pour s'organiser face à la situation. Et après de longues discussions et face aux problèmes, on a pu mettre en place un cadre de concertation des sages. Le mot sage a tout son sens parce que quelle que soit la situation euh, des, des groupes armés, il y a quand même le minimum de respect vis-à-vis -vis de la personne âgée. Et donc le cadre de concertation a été mis rapidement en place, composé des sages, des femmes, des jeunes, des autorités traditionnelles et religieuses, des responsables des collectivités territoriales, des anciens fonctionnaires et qui s'est donné pour mission d'évaluer un peu les dégâts causés par les groupes armés d'occupation, d'organiser une rencontre d'échange avec les responsables des groupes armés, de faire l'état des lieux des services sociaux de base, notamment la, la station d'eau potable de la ville de Gao, d'Ansongo et de Bourem, procéder à la fourniture continue de l'électricité aux populations des villes de Gao, Ansongue et Bourem, assurer la sécurité alimentaire des ménages euh, de Gao, Ansongue et Bourem à travers les périmètres maraîchers et les périmètres irrigués, s'occuper des aspects euh, sanitaires, notamment l'hôpital régional de Gao qui recevait déjà des blessés et les centres de référence qui sont à Gao, Ansongue et Bourem, et un peu organiser les opérateurs économiques pour recenser les problèmes et assurer le transport des personnes et des biens. Voilà un peu comment la situation très rapidement s'est présentée et qui a permis de, de stabiliser la situation et de faire en sorte que vraiment on parvient à arriver à ce stade 
pour occuper les terrains parce que l'administration n'est pas là, les forces armées de sécurité ne sont pas là et ça pose de, beaucoup de problèmes. Maintenant, par rapport à ce cadre de concertation, ils avaient une stratégie, c'est de maintenir le dialogue fécond et durable entre les groupes armés et le cadre de concertation. La désignation d'un interlocuteur de chaque côté, que ce soit les groupes armés ou les sages, établir la confiance réciproque entre les acteurs, établir une communication fluide, convenir ensemble des périodes de rencontres, gérer tous les problèmes survenus à cette occasion, bref, assurer la circulation des personnes et de leurs biens, que ce soit fluvial, terrestre ou autre chose, et assurer l'approvisionnement correct des marchés. Voilà un peu comment euh, ça s'est passé. En termes d'acquis, euh, jusqu'à la fin de l'occupation, une année après, l'approvisionnement correct de la ville en eau potable a été assuré, la fourniture d'électricité pour les ménages est euh, aussi assurée, le ravitaillement euh, en daria alimentaire euh, par rapport au raffrouvisonnement du marché ou le fonctionnement normal des périmètres irrigués ou des périmètres maraîchers qui permettent euh, de fournir des légumes aux grandes villes aussi. Et voilà un peu, mesdames et messieurs, euh, par rapport à cette expérience euh, euh, des régions nord du Mali pendant l'occupation. Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup. Voilà, le, le Sahel de façon globale. Et je pense que c'est une expérience qui, qui, qui peut être valable aussi au Niger, au Burkina Faso, et, et au Niger, au Mali, etc. Et un peu quelques aspects. Madame, voilà un peu, Suzanne, quelques aspects que je voulais vous dire. Merci, merci beaucoup, Monsieur Touré. Est-ce que, euh, est que je pouvais vous euh, demander une autre question euh, concernant la sécurité, l'instabilité, des questions comme ça Est-ce que vous pensez que les politiciens dans notre région euh, prennent suffisamment d'actions pour, euh, pour adresser, pour... Euh, pour mitiguer les risques des conflits qui sont liés à, à l'eau, euh, à l'énergie et des ressources comme ça Ou qu'est-ce qu'ils qu qu ont besoin pour prendre l'action Oui, madame, je crois que, je crois que ça, c'est quand même une question extrêmement intéressante. Et... Tous les dispositifs nécessaires en termes de législation, en termes de textes base existent. Mais vous savez, les événements de 2012 en République du Mali, notamment l'occupation de groupes djihadistes par une partie du territoire, nous a démontré à suffisance que tous les dispositifs, que ce soit du point de vue législatif ou réglementaire, que ce soit du point de vue organisation, sont largement insuffisants pour nous permettre de prévenir ou d'alerter de telles crises. C'est pourquoi il faut, il faut repenser, et c'est ça où le débat d'aujourd'hui est intéressant, il faut repenser à une nouvelle approche, à une nouvelle démarche, à une nouvelle vision par rapport à l'alerte, la, à par rapport à la prévision des crises dans, dans le Sahel. Mais, voilà, mais... Et, et évidemment, il faut qu'on trouve aujourd'hui la, la, la solution. C'est là où le débat d'aujourd'hui est extrêmement intéressant et c'est là où on a besoin de l'appui de nos experts qu'on a aujourd'hui pour nous épier pour cette question parce que tous les dispositifs, les stratégies qu'on a jusque-là euh, ont montré leurs limites. Fondamentalement, il faut qu'on trouve euh, vraiment les bons bouts et c'est ça qu'on attend euh, les grands experts comme Sharon. Etc., etc., pour nous aider à avancer sur cette question. Parce que euh, c'est très clair. Aujourd'hui, on ne peut plus dire que le gouvernement ou les politiciens sont capables de prévenir les conflits. La réalité est tout autre, autre chose. Merci. Cela veut dire aussi qu'il euh, qu ne faut pas. Euh, qu'il faut aller à l'essentiel. C'est ça la vérité. Il y a une défaillance euh, sur le terrain. Il faut réfléchir, il faut avancer, il faut de nouvelles propositions, de nouvelles stratégies par rapport à la situation. Sinon, tout ce que nous avons aujourd'hui comme élément euh, a démontré son insuffisance. Merci, madame.
Merci beaucoup. Um, I do have a follow up question for for Sharon, actually, before I might also turn to the speakers who spoke before. Um, Sharon, from your perspective, coming from the US administration, what do you think is lacking for people to move from knowing that there's a conflict risk to actually taking action? Is it money? Is it willingness? Is it capacity? You know, I, I mean, I think it's all of those things um, in the sense that, as I said, I think we tend to be very focused on what's what's right in the in the foreground, what's what's here right now. And we jump from crisis to crisis uh, and it becomes very difficult to look at what's in the media or the long term. And I think um, I think there are really some misconceptions, you know, that there's a, a belief or a bias that when you're talking about these complex links with natural resources that these things cannot be predicted or that the predictions are not reliable or at least not very far in advance um, or that you have to have 100% certainty or you can't plan against these kinds of predictions. But when you look at, uh, you know, I've, so I've, some of my background has been working with military organizations in the United States and you know, they plan all the time against uncertain futures, all the time. Um, in fact, they would consider it irresponsible not to. So the question is, how can we bring the same kind of rigor and the same kind of investment into non-military challenges? You know, and, and I think that, that that, again, requires that we, we need to uh, really rethink uh, in our governance how what we see as security and what we see as peace building and that we need to do a better job of understanding you know in our in our in our frontline policymakers how water or other natural resource challenges are causal elements you know as charlie mentioned understanding the ways in which they indirectly become causal elements we need to have a better we need to have a better understanding of what that looks like in the way that we make policy um, and so that we can bring that kind of same rigor and investment and anticipatory strength to how, how these things destabilize situations. But no, I don't think that, um, that there's enough attention or enough investment here. And the problem is, is that we're all entering a time when we can't afford that anymore, that we can't just afford to respond. Um, that's a very expensive and, and inhumane way to do governance. So we, will, we have to strengthen our ability as governments to look ahead and to make the investments in resilience and prevention rather than just responding once things get bad. So I mean, just with climate change and biodiversity loss and the scale of environmental change and also the amount of investment we need to, to mitigate against greenhouse gas emissions, we, we can't afford to just wait until things get bad to respond. We must anticipate better. Thanks a lot, Sharon. That's that's really good to know and helpful to know. I'd like to also turn to Henk again. Henk, uh, you spend a good deal of your career trying to make policymakers at the national and the international level move on questions relating to water. So, what are your key lessons learned? What what makes them really act? Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, uh, it's good to put me on the spot like this, and uh, I think. Uh, uh, and, and perhaps more um, uh, indeed from an experience point of view, uh, it's, uh, it's always a necessity for policymakers to say, see a way forward. Uh, uh, if we look in the uh, context of the challenging and, and only increasing crisis, uh, what makes them uh, what makes them work if, they, if there are opportunities? And I think that is what the, uh, what the High level panel on water also brought was this this insight that we you know coming from that understanding addressing values we find ways of organization capacity uh, management um, uh, uh, and that is also what the water peace and security initiative is driving the the the, the second thing is yeah there's always this mix in a political realm of a cry of pain so being very reactive a cry of pain of out of society which is can be very small in a in a in a country's context often, but if, if we look around the world, we see many cries of pain in the context of climate and security that really uh, immediately have politicians jump at that occasion, uh, either being very regressive, reactive, or you know progressive, reactive. 
And that is what we have to find to overcome, uh, to be ahead of the game. And I think that is the biggest challenge uh, we often find in the political domain. What is this longer line of working on preparedness, mitigating climate, uh, but also adapting to it, uh, focusing on capacity building, data and information, better governments, all these, these hard, you know, we know, uh, but uh, also very uh, 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 complex matters that take a long time and uh, three C's, uh, consistency, commitment and continuity for one, that is of critical importance in the context of this very reactive, being it either regressive or progress political domain. And I think this is the balancing act for policymakers. How can we make it politically viable that this longer term approach of preparedness and focusing on these very complex challenges that are often not of today of tomorrow is of critical value in the political domain because they touch upon these, these very short term crises we face every day. And climate makes this more urgent. Eh? It's, it's on two ways. It's this magnifying glass making all crises more uh, and bigger. And at the same time, it's uh, getting hitting us at a speed uh, not seen yet. And I think that brings political momentum, but it should not be the political momentum to increase reactivism, but it should uh, cre create that political momentum to increase the opportunity to become very proactive in a very progressive way. And I see that is where the opportunity lies, but that is also well, it's a hard fought uh, battle. Thanks. Last, perhaps, sorry, last country, donor countries like also mine really love pilots. And that is a real problem because uh, uh, you know, we jump from crisis to crisis to crisis across the world. And that does not build uh, uh, redundancy and resiliency in our systems, in our societies, in the communities at risk. But they can. Eh? So if we co combine uh, this level of opportunity eh? and, and innovation a pilot is also very opportunistic in the positive sense with this connection of consistency, continuity and commitment, all these initiatives we have, then we can build a pipeline. Then one pilot can lead to a program and a program into a pipeline. And then we can, can, can battle against the vested interest of the past, the stupid policies and practices that actually make us more vulnerable uh, and so forth and so forth and use these opportunities that are political as a way to drive change that is uh, that is sustainable yeah. sorry last comment thanks a lot Hank I see uh, Monsieur Touré you would like to add can I just ask you to be very very brief uh, less than a minute because we're running out of time Monsieur Touré <laughs> Oui, euh, ouais, merci, 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 merci Suzanne. Euh, je voudrais dire que il y a deux ou trois aspects sur lesquels je voudrais revenir euh, en termes de en termes de propositions de solutions. Le premier, c'est vraiment de lutter contre les inégalités sociales. Vous savez, la plupart des problèmes qu'on a sont liés aux inégalités sociales parce que la justice est mal répartie, parce qu'il y a une mauvaise gouvernance, parce que l'administration ne fait pas son travail, et ça crée des problèmes, et cette inégalité sociale, son aboutissement est l'exclusion sociale. Et c'est ça le grand problème. C'est pourquoi il faut une fois de plus une solidarité internationale, et justement à travers le panel que nous sommes en train de faire aujourd'hui, pour permettre à nos États d'avancer sur ces questions, d'identifier de, de, à travers le monde des bonnes pratiques en matière de prévention et de gestion de conflits et l'extrapoler dans le Sahel. C'est extrêmement important parce que ce n'est pas fondamentalement tous ces aspects qu'on considère, mais c'est plutôt au niveau de la gouvernance, comme Sharon l'a dit, que ça ne marche pas et c'est ça qui crée des problèmes. Merci euh, Suzanne par Mais... rapport à ces problèmes.
Merci beaucoup, merci. Um, I have one final question left that I would like to ask um, Hilde Hardemann from the EU, because I would be curious to know, given the overall forecasting ability that the EU has, not only on water, energy and food, but generally, how do you think this can help uh, moving to action? And what do you think the key next steps or the key priorities are for the EU, its member countries, but also policymakers elsewhere to really get to action? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the very interesting uh, debate, for the uh, very good information and uh, ideas. And uh, so I think that what uh, was said before by uh, Ms. Burke, uh, by Mr. Ovink, uh, by Mr. Touré uh, about the importance of not going into re a reactive mode, but being trying to be there uh, early on uh, not to react to every crisis. We have to react to crises, of course, but we have to build resilience. We have to build capacity. Uh, this is crucial. Uh, of course, the European Union is a big regulatory power, uh, a big donor uh, internationally, has also a certain convening power when it comes to um, global challenges. Um, has a good overview, as you say. Um, our president, uh, President von der Leyen, has put uh, climate change, uh, battling that together and leading worldwide as her key priority uh, for her entire mandate. And um, you were asking about our foreign policy as European Union. Well, we try. Uh, it's clear that you cannot deal with a question like the climate if you do not work together uh, across the entire globe, because it's a global uh, question. So the European Union really tries to use all its tools, its internal regulatory tools, uh, uh, its trade tools, its foreign policy, its diplomacy, uh, its uh, development assistance um, to go in the same direction uh, and to try uh, and build up, uh, first of all, the awareness. We cannot work on resilience. We cannot work on capacity if we are not aware that this is a crucial uh, topic to work on uh, and then depending of course on the partner uh, and we have as European Union maybe also the advantage compared to uh, national uh, governments um, uh, as Mr. Oving said uh, who like pilot projects we can take the longer term uh, the commission is always there uh, we work uh, for longer periods of time and build very patiently step by step uh, to move in that direction we try to bring partners along uh, we work in a Team Europe approach together with uh, the European Union uh, governments. Water uh, and climate are key concerns there. We work with our international partners. I'm looking to Ms. Burke, but I'm looking also towards all the international organizations and, of course, with the governments uh, on the spot. So awareness and then um, early warning and making sure that all the practices that we can see in our own uh, countries, because we are also confronted with those problems and elsewhere that we can bring those together and that we can find in every situation the best possible instrument. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, we're unfortunately running out of time. The session is coming to an end very soon. Um, I would therefore like to hand over to Alexandre Mesnil. Alexandre um, comes from GIZ, the German Development Cooperation Agency, and is managing the Frexus project, which is a project that, together with WPS, works on the conflict risks that might be arising from water, energy, and food insecurity. Alex, your last take on the session. Um, thanks a lot. Can you can you hear me? Um, well, thanks, thanks to, to, to everybody for this interesting discussion. I'm so sorry for, um, for, for the kind of hiccup with, uh, with the, the technical director of the Niger Basin authorities who would have uh, uh, basically shared experiences on how to implement this, uh, this concrete uh, action and all the challenges are facing in this region. Just to, um, just to sum up a, a bit, uh, summarize, uh, to take away some, some, some key message in the very short time. Thanks to the to the to the Charlie's Iceland presentation, we could we could have a better idea of understanding conflict uh, prediction and all the complexity, as it was mentioned uh, 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 several several times. But the, the challenge is now due to the, the, the 
climate change impacts. Uh, knowing better knowledge is, is good, but we are obviously urgent action is needed. Obviously, we are further to work to to go to 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 to, to action, and it's not necessarily. It's, of course, there is a bit of uh, 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 awareness uh, raising to do at a high level, at the local level. People are in the front line are suffering for this. It's how to implement this concrete alternatives, concrete action in function of all these various situation, all these complexities that it's kind of what's mentioned by, by, by Mrs. Berg, it's kind of fear, it's kind of difficult to, 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 to do for it. But I, I will take with this last word that we, we have to try to, to make uh, uh, all these challenges, all this complexity, not only uh, uh, um, um, difficulties, but to turn off, to make, to make natural resources their management uh, a resource for, for, for peace and to work much more on peace building um, at global and, and, and local level like GIZ, like the world um, the WPSP is, is currently doing, for instance, for instance, for the for the Frexus project. I would like just to thank you, all of you, all the Madame Hardeman from EU, the, the Dutch government, the German government, of course, all the panelists, uh, Mr. Touré in Mali with all the connection difficulties. Sam in Niger, so sorry for, but we, 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 I invite you to, to continue this discussion. We will document this session. You will find it on the Nexus resource platform that it will be posted in the, in the chat and of course on the platform on the WPSP website, most probably. Uh, and we can, you can contact us anytime on these two um, platform online to continue the discussion. Thanks a lot to the organizer behind because we have some hiccups and they are managing. And thanks to you, Suzanne, from the great moderation as always. Thanks a lot, guys. And we stay in touch. Bye-bye.